great joy for me to be here with you. Uh, I want to preface everything I will say by just explaining that to only have 25 minutes to speak uh, within the context of my ministry is actually quite unspiritual. <laughs> uh, I realize that some of you might come from churches who, where they believe if you can't say something within 10 minutes, it's probably not worth saying at all. Uh, but at least within Asia and certainly within China, if you can't preach for an hour and a half, uh, both uh, your spirituality is questioned as well as the spirituality of the person who invited you to come and speak. Uh, so I have a tremendous challenge uh, before me uh, to speak within 25 minutes, and the challenge is uh, especially difficult from the standpoint of the fact that I have been asked to speak about the whole church a glorious subject uh, that certainly probably we could spend hours uh, talking upon. But it's a great joy to be here with you. Uh, if you were here yesterday evening, I uh, especially highlighted the fact that I believe we live in very exciting times, uh, in times where you and I have, uh, in many ways, a unique opportunity to see uh, the completion of the Great Commission of Jesus Christ and yesterday evening I especially highlighted several things that I believe are foundational uh, toward the completion of the Great Commission of Jesus Christ. Uh, I highlighted the fact that transportation has greatly facilitated the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When my great-great-grandfather Hudson Taylor went to China in 1853 it took him 163 days to get there. Uh, if you were to fly from Heathrow to the city of Shanghai or perhaps to the city of Beijing today, it would only take you about 12 hours. In other words, what took those early missionaries uh, nearly half a year to do, you and I can do in half a day. And certainly we can think of how that has indeed tremendously uh, facilitated the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we think especially of the whole aspect of short-term missions and how the convenience of transportation has lent itself toward the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Incidentally, just as we are in short-term missions, if you were to go back and read mission, mission literature of that day, uh, this word short-term did not exist. And of course, uh, that's understandable because it took him 163 days just to get there. Uh, and of course, it took him 163 days to get back. But transportation has greatly facilitated the great commission of Jesus Christ. We went on to talk about migration. We live in a migratory world where God is bringing uh, people from distant shores to our shores, to our very neighborhood. And we emphasize the fact that the proximity of the mission field tests our sincerity for the mission field. The proximity of the mission field, as God brings people to our very doorstep, that in and of itself tests our sincerity for the mission field. And I would put before you today a good gauge of whether we are global Christians is are we reaching out to the world that is around us, that is in our neighborhood, that is in our city. We no longer have to go to Japan to reach the Japanese. God has brought the Japanese to our neighborhood. We no longer have to go to China to reach the Chinese. God has brought the Chinese to our neighborhood. We no longer have to go to the Middle East to reach the Muslim world. God has brought the Muslim world to our country. The proximity of the mission field tests our sincerity for the mission field. And so we talked a little bit about migration. We talked also about mobilization. And this is something that very much excites me because I believe that in these end days we need to see a redoubling of individuals using their Christian professions, or sorry, using their professions as a platform of professing their faith in Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you a simple story that very much impressed 
uh, that upon my heart. It happened about t uh, 20 years ago. Our family had just moved to Hong Kong and I was asked by colleagues to travel to uh, a city in the in inland part of China to go to a school. It was a very interesting school. It was a communist party school, especially dedicated to providing continuing education for uh, communist party members, especially in the whole area of medicine. And I went there to find out whether it would be possible for us uh, to place medical doctors in that school, whether it would be possible for us to place English teachers in that school. I still remember the morning I went to speak to the principal, and just as we began our conversation, he stopped me dead in my tracks with this question. He said, Mr. Taylor, I just want to ask you one thing. Are all the medical doctors, are all the uh, English teachers that you are going to bring to my school, are they all Christians? You know, at that point in time, I thought our conversation was over. Here was a communist party school, and after all, communism, or we should say, Marx said that opium was the, the uh, sorry, Christianity was the opium of the masses. That even those early missionaries were merely tools of imperialism. I turned to that principal that day and I told him, I said, yes, we are all Christians. I thought that that was probably end. He would say to me, there is the door. Uh, I won't be seeing you out. But I'll never forget that morning. He looked me dead in the eye and he said, good. I hope you only bring Christians to my school. I hope you only bring Christians to my school. And God used that very small event to open my eyes to see that in the day and age that you and I live in, we need to mobilize Christians via their professions to profess the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that actually just in Asia alone, 80% of Asia's population, it comes out to be about 1.7 billion people. 1.7 billion people live where traditional missionaries cannot go, where preachers cannot go. But let me tell you that the door is open for proclaimers of the faith to go. Proclaimers who are willing to allow their lives, to allow their vocations, their jobs to be used by God for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, we talked also about globalization. And that will be something that I would like to talk about more with you tomorrow afternoon. But this, this afternoon, what I'd like to turn our thoughts to is the local church. The local church and the role that the local church has in global missions. And I don't know what New Testament example immediately comes to your mind, but the example obviously that immediately came to my mind was the church at Antioch. You remember that Luke actually describes the church at Antioch there in the, the 11th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. And we have a wonderful description. I think it's chapter 11, verse 19 to 30. A wonderful description of the beginning of the Antioch church. And then in chapter 13, we have a further description of a church, the Antioch church with a vision to be a part of what God wanted to do in and through them in global missions. And it is to these verses that I want to draw your attention uh, this afternoon. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 13. And I want to just read the few verses at the very beginning of this chapter. Acts chapter 13, Luke there says this in verse 1, In the church at Antioch there were prophets and there were teachers. There was Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger, Lucius from uh, Serene, Manion, who was brought up uh, with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Verse 2 goes on to tell us, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands upon them and sent them off. And then the first part of verse 4, the two of them, that is Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, the two of them went on their way by the Holy Spirit. It's a familiar passage. 
And in the very brief time that I have with you, I want to just share with you four points that it would seem are pivotal in the Antioch church becoming part of global missions and what God wanted to do in and through them in global missions. I want you to notice, first of all, that Luke describes for us a church whose passion was energized. A church whose passion was energized. He tells us there that they were worshiping and they were fasting and they were praying. Here was a church. Here is a community, brothers and sisters, whose passion for God and the things of God were energized. And I believe that that is actually at the very core of every church, that every church needs its passion for global missions energized. And as I was preparing, I thought of just three things that I think is very important. First of all, our passion for God's glory needs to be energized. Just a minute ago, we were, just, we were reminded of a statement made by, J, uh, by John Piper, that great pastor from the United States, where he said, where there is no worship, there is mission. Where there is no worship, there is mission. And he reminds us of the importance of being passionate for God's glory. Just as we closed our worship this afternoon by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven? You remember those three requests or those three petitions that follow? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Passion. Energized, not only for God's glory, but also a realization of man's sinfulness and the need for man to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mentioned yesterday afternoon that this year is a significant year in OMF, the organization that my wife and I and our family have been a part of for the last nearly 30 years. It was started by my great great grandfather Hudson Taylor under the name the China Inland. Mission. And if you have a chance of reading any of his writing, you will quickly notice that one of the things that so propelled him to dedicate his life to the Lord and to dedicate his life, and he served in China for well over 50 years, and it was simply this, a passion for lost souls, a passion for lost souls. He calculated out that there was one million a month, one million Chinese a month raced into a Christless eternity. And that was the thing that struck him. That was the thing that propelled him forward. A passion for the lostness of man. And the need for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that passion energized. It was not only for God's glory. Not only for man's need for salvation. But also Christ's uniqueness. That in heaven and on earth. There is no other name by which you and I can be saved. Save through the name of Jesus Christ. And my friends, brothers and sisters, I believe that that truth, the uniqueness of Jesus Christ is something that is being challenged, not outside of the church, but even within the church. And in the pluralistic world that we live in, the message that we continually hear is that Jesus Christ is but a way rather than the way. He is a truth rather than the truth. He is a life rather than the life. But as I read scripture, I can see no other way around it. That save through Jesus Christ, no one can go to the Father. And it is the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, I believe, in the 21st century that will challenge us over and over again. Do we believe in the uniqueness of Jesus Christ? Is he but a way or is he the way? And so we see, first of all, the Antioch church, a church whose passion was energized. And we can say so much more about that. We need to ask ourselves, are our passions energized? Are our churches energized when it comes to global missions? 
But as I come back to Luke's description, another thing I'm struck with, not only was their passion energized, but their perspective was enlarged. Here we're especially told of the work that the Lord had set aside for Saul and Barnabas to go about. And in a sense, God wanted their perspective and their understanding of God's work to be expanded, that God's work was not just there in Antioch. But God's work was where God would send Paul and and Barnabas to. And in many ways, I believe that you and I and our perspectives also need to be enlarged. We need to realize that God is not just working in our context, and we thank him for that. But God is also working around the world today. And we need to make ourselves familiar with the needs of the world. And where are some of the places where the gospel has yet to go? I believe that that's a fresh challenge for us. And I would just put before you, if you've never owned a book entitled Operation World, make it a point to get a hold of that book because that will absolutely become a treasure house in our understanding of not only what God is doing in the world today, but also what is yet still to be done in the world today. What does God still want to work in and through you and I in? And our perspectives need to be enlarged. A wonderful friend of mine called Paul Borthwick, perhaps some of you have come across Paul. He lives in the United States, but he said something once that struck me, and I've never forgot it. He was once asked, what is the goal of his life? And it was simply this. He said, the goal of my life is that I would know something about everywhere and I would know everything about somewhere. That I would seek to broaden, to enlarge my perspective so that I would know something about everywhere And yet at the same time to know everything about somewhere. Probably I should ask Paul whether that's even possible. But I thought it was a wonderful goal and it's a goal that I believe each and every one of us needs to set in our hearts to understand what God is doing. God's work. Just as here we're told of God saying to the church at Antioch, there is work that I have set aside for these two brothers to do and I want you to go and be in, them to be involved in it. And so their, uh, their perspective was enlarged. Their perspective was enlarged. But then thirdly, not only was their passion energized, not only was their perspective enlarged, but it's interesting how prayer was also engaged. Prayer was also engaged. I don't have the time this afternoon to share with you just from my organization, the OMF, or perhaps even earlier, the CIM, how prayer was such an important aspect of the foundation and and the furtherance of the work that God had to do or wanted to do through the CIM. I just want to draw your attention to one simple example. And it's actually something that will be celebrated in just about a week's time down in Brighton. Because it was there on June 25th, 1865, that Hudson Taylor, after worshiping in a church, a local church there in Brighton, went on to the Brighton beach. And with Bible in hand, he prayed that God would raise up 24 willing and able workers to go to China. 24 willing and able workers to go to China. And God answered that prayer. And subsequent to that 24, literally hundreds were raised up, not just to go to China, but literally around the the globe. And prayer needs to be the center of our church. Could I just share an example? And actually, the former senior pastor of the church that Mimi, my wife, and I attended is with us this afternoon here, Reverend Andrew Shunt. But I remember sitting down with Reverend Shun and sharing with him of how I praise God for what God is doing through the church there in Taipei that he was serving as senior pastor. Every year we had a mission conference and every year funds were set aside for mission work. 
And it was a wonderful thing that God was doing through the church. But as we were talking, we suddenly realized that so often prayer for missions is something that we might just relegate to to the mission conference or we might just relegate it to one prayer meeting, the, the, fifth, the, the fifth Sunday of, 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 uh, of a month, perhaps if it comes up every quarter. And as we were reflecting upon that, we thought perhaps what we should do is have a time of prayer for missions every Sunday in our church. And I thank God for his godly leadership. He saw that that was an important thing for us to do. And I cannot begin to tell you the impact that just those two, those three minutes of praying for missions, how that has impacted the church and transformed the church. Prayer. So important and certainly so much more that we can say. But their prayers were engaged. Their prayers were engaged. And so their passion was energized. Their perspectives were enlarged. Their prayers were engaged. But then very quickly and lastly, their people were empowered. Their people were empowered. And it isn't wonderful to realize that This local church, the Antioch church, set aside their two best and sent them out on missions. And I pray that in the context of the local church that you serve in, wherever it might be, that we don't give to God the second best, but rather we give to God the best. And we see people empowered, both locally as well as globally, for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Passion energized, perspectives enlarged, prayer engaged, people empowered. I'll never forget, it was my first trip to the city of Wenzhou, which is on the coast of China. Wenzhou is a very unique city in China, There's about 600 million people in that city. Although we do not know for certain, but by probably even the most conservative estimates, we're told that nearly 10% of those 6 million people in just that one city of Wenzhou are followers of Jesus Christ. Some of you might be a bit familiar with what's going on in China of late, especially actually in that city of Wenzhou where the Chinese government has torn down well over 400 crosses on the top of churches. It's a city where God has wonderfully blessed and Christians are multiplying by the day. I'll never forget one afternoon as I was sitting there talking to two brothers, both leaders of a local church. And as our conversation came to an end, I turned to them and I said to them, what can we pray? How can we pray for you? How can we pray for the church, the local church here in Wenzhou? I'll never forget how they responded. They said, well, perhaps you've heard something. You've heard people refer to our city, Wenzhou, as the Jerusalem of China. And that is actually a term that is used to describe this city of Wenzhou. That we are the Jerusalem of China. And I said, that's a wonderful nickname or that's a wonderful name to be referred to. Just as God blessed the church in Jerusalem, so God is blessing the church there in Wenzhou. But that afternoon, I'll never forget how they responded to me. They simply said this, Pastor Taylor, we do not want to be known as the Jerusalem of China. Rather, pray that the Lord would help us be the Antioch of China. And that's my prayer as we close this afternoon. That your church and my church, our local churches, would be Antiochs in the 21st century. We would be churches, we would be communities of believers whose passion is energized. A desire to see God glorified amongst the people. To see the lostness of man and the need for salvation. But also to see the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. That he is not a way, a truth, a life. But rather he is the truth, the way, and the life.
passion energized. To have our perspectives enlarged. To know something about everywhere. And yet strive to know everything about somewhere. What is God doing in the world today? And how can we be a part of what he's doing? To be engaged in prayer. Whether that is personal prayer or corporate prayer. To see our churches return to our knees. I'll never forget Hudson Taylor's statement to Jonathan Goforth, that great Canadian revivalist who wrote Hudson Taylor asking for advice and entering a very difficult province in China. Hudson Taylor responded to Jonathan Goforth simply by saying that we, that is the CIM, have sought repeatedly to enter into that province, but we have failed every time. That province, and he goes on to say, that province will be entered only on our knees and on our knees alone. And my friends, may we be engaged in prayer. And yes, lastly, may our people be empowered to be a witness for Jesus Christ. May the Lord help your church and my church to be Antioch churches of the 21st century. Amen.